Yeah. Right. Right. Too, not too loud? No, no. Okay, we'll try to keep it at that level. Yeah. Now, uh, just first I need, need to acknowledge that this is uh, a major subject and you don't prepare this sort of presentation on your own. So there's a little bit of acknowledgement and there's a bit more later on. Just to remind ourselves the extent of this basin and how tiny the South Australian pit is, the runoff in a sense South Australia is, is, is negligible. And this is the elevation as you see, of course, the mountain mountains are the Great Dividing Range. The runoff, water runoff, of course, is uh, you know, very much determined by rainfall. And when rainfall is less than, say, um, 300 millimetres, there's very, very little. The, uh, and, and much of this basin is, is in that sort of rainfall, um, and annual rainfall averages. So most of it is in the Victorian and New South Wales Southern Highlands there. <coughs> now that annual average annual runoff is what, what the, the width of those brown streaks there, can you all see this? Yes, yep. Yep. Yeah. The width of that is, is the amount of water that would get down the river in a year on an average. And allowing for losses due to, to uh, tr transpiration and evaporation, but not allowing for any ir irrigation take. So you can see that the water coming down the, the Darling, for example, um, increases as the tributaries, uh, and, but it decreases as it, as it goes down due to losses in the system. And the, the, the average that would get down the end there is of the order of 13 to 14,000 uh, gigalitres, 13 to 14 million, million litres per year. These numbers we'll get used to during the, the evening. And what I'll talk about is how, how salinity is managed, first of all, and, and we, we'll go back and do a little bit, little bit of history, the, the, the early attempts at, at uh, salinity management and the frustrations in the present program called the Basin Salinity Management Strategy. I will look into two envi major environmental issues that have salinity implications, particularly the Lower Lakes thing and the Murray Darling Basin Plan, which is uh, the, the plan now to get a good balance between environmental flows and, and uh, uses of water and irrigation which will hopefully allow both better environmental and salinity outcomes. Now, salt, where does it come from? People used to say, oh, this basin below Swan Hill, we, let's see if I can, we just, you can see up from the Mildura, up, up a bit from there is, is Mildura, is Swan Hill. Below that, the majority of you, the majority of the, of the landscape is Mallee. The Mallee veg vegetation is amongst the best in the world at intersecting water. The rainfall averages somewhere from 250 to 325 millimetres per year. And the Mallee will intersect all but one or two millimetres of that. And that's amazing. And the rainfall may contain maybe 20 milligrams per litre of, of salt. There might be some more coming, coming in particular form. And what can the, therefore, the, the, um, the osmosis effects of the roots separate out the fresh, fresh water and leave the salt behind. And the salt is washed down below the root zone by the, the that, that part of the of the rainfall. It's not intercepted and not taken by the by the roots and washed down below the root zone. And that is at the salinity around about seawater. Sure. Uh, so it's extremely effective, and that's where it came from. The the, the salt that is there now, and in the natural natural conditions of mountain vegetation cover. The groundwater for a, uh, for uh, much of the of the Mallee 
is way, way down under the present climatic conditions. And before European satellite, this illustrates it really, there was a extremely low gradient of salt going towards the river here. But some salt produced nevertheless. And when Captain Sturt went down Murrumbidgee, his diary notes, gosh, it's getting salty here. Um, and this is this is what that, that this is the effect that he noted. Now, the, 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 the factors that have resulted in the production of, of, of high salinity in the river, higher than, than, um, than the average in, in early history, are two things. One is past inefficient water use, and second, over allocation of water sources. And the, those two things resulted in sail the salinisation that we've seen. We'll also talk about the, the, the overallocation has had the effects of degrading the wetlands and floodplains and the terminal lakes. What happened during the 19... The, the, the ir first irrigation satisfied by, by the Chafee brothers uh, in Renmark and Rotira was succeeded after the World Wars by, by, by growing irrigation areas of quite small blocks put in in the right after World War, War I mainly, but some after World War II. But it was in the 1950s and 60s that it was decided that, that this, uh, there was a, this should be, should, should be increased. And the, the, in, in Auckland, the river was regulated by dams upstream and, and in, in the tributaries in the states and in the area that's controlled by the River Murray Commission, which in turn was controlled by New South Wales, South Australia, Victoria, with the, with the Commonwealth as chair. And the, the area that of the, the, the basin that is uh, that South Australia uh, has some entitlement to is the water that enters the river upstream of Albury. So Hugh Dam and Darmouth Dam upstream of Albury is what we get a share of. So New South Wales and Victoria were, did and were able to construct dams on the other tributaries. And this is the result, a huge increase in capacity up to three times, nearly three times, two and a half times the average flow of the river. And that's the growth in water use. And, and, and as, as time has gone on, right up to the, what we see now of almost 13,000 gigalitres per year. New South Wales had the big, is the blue one, and has had that big growth through from 1950 odd to 1980, but still kept growing. Um, to the extent that New South Wales, Al New South Wales government in trying to please its growers in the, in the upstream areas like the Namoi Nam 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 in the tributaries of the Murray um, allocated so much water that their own growers further down didn't get it for years. <laughs> so, so I visited the Tandau cotton scheme which utilises the, the plains of the uh, often the, the outer ones of the Menindi Lakes. And when we visited, they hadn't had any water for seven or eight years. And there was still another couple of years to go before they got any. And they had $2 million worth of equipment sitting there, which they just kept alive by, by watering their orange grove, which, for which they got just enough water. And this sort of situation was very common in New South Wales. I have a quiz for you. I'm going to talk a little bit about the efficiency of irrigation. Now, there are two definitions of, of, of irrigation efficiency. One is what the farmer would, li would like to see, and that is a small amount of money put in, a lot of money put out, a lot of money taken out, money at the farm yard. There is a water definition of efficiency, and that is what proportion of the water applied to, to an area of land 
is actually used to, to buy the crop to produce the crop. And if you are if you're using 100% of it, there's nothing left to go down below the root zone, so you'll accumulate salt. But if you're using only 50%, there's a huge waste. It's joining that, that uh, groundwater below and causing it to rise. What we see here is uh, four examples of water use. Uh, cattle in the probably terrain irrigation area in Victoria. Uh, any grass irrigated by flood irrigation. A uh, almond orchard watered by, by under tree sprinklers. A cotton, a cotton field um, by flood irrigation. And what I think is a potato plant plantation, but they're just starting off. Which do you think has the highest water use efficiency and which is the lowest? Any guesses? Cattle. Yeah, the cattle. The cattle. The, the, the cattle growing. Because they have not, you all they use is flood irrigation, and they have not had the cattle growing for either dairy production or meat. Is it is a, a a low return operation? They can't afford to laser level and get their fields perfect so that when you put some water on, you don't get deep puddles which waste water and get evaporate and don't produce, produce, produce grass at the, at the uniform rate. So by far the worst efficiency on the river has been this sort of irrigation. And the average for that would have been around 50%. And uh, the others are higher. The almonds these days are around about 90%. Cotton growing can, can achieve that, and potato growing a little bit less. Something usually about 90 as well these days. So, before 1986, irrigation infrastructure that was, was very ill suited to an efficient crop production. It was put in a lot of it after World War I, channels, no, no pipelines, or very few, so that Farmers couldn't use piped irrigation. They, they had to use flood. And, and very often these channels themselves spilled as well. And they didn't have the capacity to get the water to the farmer when he really needed it. So for most crops in those days, water use efficiency was low. I remember visiting an, a, a, a grape growing area in, in, in the Berry area. And uh, you were walking through um, on through water half the time. And raise, all this wasted water raised water tables and we will show how. And it caused this sort of salinity all around. In fact, Kerrang irrigation area, 30% of it was lost to, to salt. This is what happens. First of all, when the, the mallee is cleared for uh, for growing wheat, for example, or sheep, the, the mallee is no longer there to intercept the rain, but there's still only, what is it, uh, the natural rainfall uh, hitting the soil. Some of it is used by the grass, and about uh, maybe a quarter of it will get through, and the groundwater level starts rising and causing a greater flow of the river. What happens when we apply irrigation? Far more water if you get, instead of the 300 millimetres of rainfall, in, you, you get in addition 50% uh, of the applied irrigation water, which might be uh, um, an, another 1,000 or 700 millimetres. You're getting a huge rate of rise in this amount of water. Because that is then sloping downwards that way, water flows downhill, it's sloping, it's, it's forced into the, the, the sands under the river and into the river. And it's that what has caused salinity disasters in the 1967 drought and subsequently. In fact, here's a, a graph since 1970 missing out that. And what you see there is the flow in salinity 1970 2010. And the red line is salinity and it's and its axis is on the on the this side uh, that side over there and the alarm level is where that 
red circle is, and they 800 electrode conductivity units, that's about 500 milligrams per litre of, of salt in the water. That starts causing significant crop damage. Above that, the, the crop damage level goes higher and higher. So you've got, you've got periods of, uh, of, of uh, salinity in the 1,000 to 1,400 uh, range. So no wonder there was a, there was a outcry from the farmers. Something needed to be done about that. Another thing you'll notice about this graph is the flow. The flow, the flow, um, what is proper for, for the lakes and keeping the mouth open is significant spring flows of water in flood times. Now, and also for covering the floodplains, like the Chowla flood which in natural conditions would be covered, say, once every three years or so on the edge. But you can see that in this graph, the flows, which need to be above 60,000 to cover anything much, and above 100,000 to cover, cover a fair bit of the floodplain, there's hardly any of those flood events actually occurring. There's a good one in 1974, nothing much else. And from 1994, nothing at all. Um, so the floodplains are, are in, were in big trouble over that, from that period. So in response to that situation, uh, a number of things needed to happen. The old River Murray Commission was controlled by water, water people only, and it was important to get a multidisciplinary attempt at managing the river. So some very courageous and hard-working people got together. Um, the people I remember who were really effective in this in South Australia were, were people like um, Des Corcoran and uh, Keith Lewis and uh, um, John Redcliffe and uh, a, few, a few other people. And they got the River Murray the governments to change the, the terms of reference of, of the River Murray Commission to include agriculture and, and, and environment as well as water for irrigation in town. That made a big effect. So, and that happened in 1982. The second uh, event was that in 1983 we proposed in South Australia that instead of farmers being stuck with uh, our water allocation, uh, which had been given to them by the government, uh, which they couldn't sell very easily unless they sold the land as well and, they, and got out of it. The only thing that we, 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 pro we proposed is that trading water rights independently of land could take place. And this was a major step forward because it meant that those who could use the water most efficiently um, bought water up, bought land and water, and, and there was and those who had the, the least profit or kept making losses, like some of those uh, cattle farmers in the Crane area, sold water to the people that grew grapes and almonds, for example, who could make, make big money out of it and, and, and afford to put in irrigation management systems that made sure that water use efficiency was very, very, very high. Um, so water used to more profitable crops and to higher water use efficiency. The other thing we did was to say, you know, this, this, this idea of the government running these irrigation areas for farmers is, is uh, crazy because uh, government is, is always limited in what, you know, what it can do. They're very inflexible. The farmers would ask the government guys, we need water today. Can you give it to us? I remember one government official saying, Mind your own business. <laughs> now, what um, what we what we tried to do, and succeeded in the end, was to put the government irrigation areas in the hands of the farmers, and and at the same time, persuaded the state and federal governments to to kick in with the farmers the money to upgrade the irrigation infrastructure so that it was pipelined and under pressure so that they could use really efficient irrigation. This all came together at once, um, and the, that meant that the people on the existing irrigation areas could, 
could upgrade their, their profitability dramatically, reduce their environment, their, their salinity impact dramatically. When I started this work in, 19, in the early 1980s, the three poorest towns in the whole of Australia, according to the tax department, were Renmark, Berry, and Loxton. Three poorest towns in Australia. That's far from so many. The, the next thing we did was salinity inception as a program to try, and I'll explain more about that, as the first steps in getting salt <laughs> levels down. And, we, and the first steps in environmental managing water, managing water in a way that would, would water those, those floodplains if we could, if it was possible. And some of them it was, some, some of them it wasn't at the time. Here is uh, an example of the Wulpunga scheme. This is not caused, this is one scheme where the salinity is not caused by the, by the uh, irrigators. This is natural, this one. And we thought, you know, if we could get the irrigators and governments and the upstream states to pay for this, then salinity would be reduced in South Australia without them going further than they could afford in reducing salinity inputs themselves. What happens here is that in the, the Renbark Group Aquifer, there's groundwater that is very salty, saltier even than this stuff, which is uh, seawater, and right under the river, or near the river, at, in the, in the Wulpunda area, is a window in this, in this normally impermeable formation. So water is bubbling out, and uh, not bubbling, but flowing out upwards, and contributing a lot of salt in that stretch of the river. So what, what some of our smart guys came up with is let's put a line of oil in up and down each side of the river like that and pump the water out to an evaporation basin. And that system of a curtain of, curtain of boreholes pumping salt water out became the standard method of, of dealing with flows into the river, groundwater flows into the river from both irrigation and natural sources of salt from that time. And here is an illustration of what you actually aim for because the previous slide actually showed you drawing too much water. What you're aiming for is that the, the salt water which is come, coming towards the river as, as on a slope, it should, it, and it normally, come, it naturally come, would come in like that and be flowing that way. You aim to use the pump water out so that this level, this uh, boundary between the saturated and unsaturated zone is dead horizontal. Because if it's dead horizontal, there's no flow into the river at all. If you if you actually slope it downwards towards the well, you're actually pumping more water than you need. So you've got to try to get that dead right. So the, the, the southern drainage strategy from 1988 pushed ahead with that sort of species. And a number of them were, and were, were introduced and they, they aimed, gained a, a salinity reduction of ATPC. And that was succeeded by, in the year 2000, by a um, more sophisticated one. The problem was that the there was a problem of equity. The state said, "Now, who's who's gaining out of this? Are we getting are we getting our value for money, or is someone else gaining at our, at our expense?" So what 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 point happened was that um, they established salinity tables and said, "Now we have to, you you're allowed to you, each state has to be responsible for a third of that of reduction of of salinity inputs of a third of that." Uh, gap between the present state and the target, and I can account will be taken of everyone's salt input and everyone's salt extraction and all new stems that come along, whether they're putting salt in or take it out, are accredited in a register to or, or as, a, as a credit or a debit to the state. So each state can see that they are, that that equity is taking place. And there's a reason for it, for it besides the, the, the 
the natural desire for equity. And that is that interstate relations, as we all remember, have really been rocky for a long time. And there's complete distrust for many years between the states. Um, I remember uh, we took the New South Wales government to its own land, uh, to its own court, to stop it from contributing salt to someone. And they, they thought this was this was pretty nasty. We thought they were pretty nasty. And a lot of it was due to the fact we didn't know each other. We all no, none of us trusted each other. And this this system under the basic selenium management strategy was aimed at establishing over years a trusting relationship between all those involved and in consolidated relationship. And this is the target at the bottom there. Maintain the salinity of more than less than 800 EC units 90% of the time, 95% of the time. You can't do that by just looking at a graph. You actually have to model it over, over a, an established period using computers. And that's what, um, that, that is how you can, you can get a standard determination of the contribution of salt water taking out of, out of salt. So there it is, the slightly regulated framework, the, what, a, a, an accountable action under the, under the what is now the, the law is uh, something that will contribute more than a certain amount of salt, one EC unit at more. Um, so the states account for their credits and debits, debits and they place those in registers. There's annual reporting by the states and the Murray Island Basin Commission. Each state has to, has to have a a qualified consultant review and analyse and review any new proposal, whether it's putting salt in and taking it out. <coughs> and to make sure there's fair play, there is a system of peer review. Somebody completely independent of that state uh, examines the consultant's work in a report, interviews them, visits the area, and says, Is this right, Origin? And my, my job for, for part of the last five or six years has been to examine the Victorian reports on that because the Victorians and South Australians agreed that I would, I would be difficult to put, it would be difficult for them to pull the wall over my, over my eyes with all that experience. And scientific and technical audits. So the overall program, progress on the overall program was audited uh, intensively. I was involved in that too. And they actually achieved that, that, that reduction. So there's quite a lot of these things. Um, you can see that there's 18 of them uh, being, being, being constructed and it's very, very effective. 3, 398,000 tonnes of salt in the last 12 months was taken out of the river. Considering that the average salt in a, in a, in a contribution in, say, a entitled flow year, a normal flow year without a flood, is uh, about a million. That's a huge introduction, huge contribution. So you can see that. That this is a sort of an illustration of, uh, of uh, the trade-offs, how the trade-offs are assessed, <coughs> and, and that each state has to be in credit, so that the, the debits don't uh, outweigh the, the, the credits. And the salinity registers uh, manage the basin-wide trade-offs. The effectiveness, it meets it. It saved horticulture in 2007 and 2009. Uh, operations and maintenance cost is $8 million a year. That's a lot of money. Now, there's a review uh, being taken of that, and it's been found to be somewhat overachieving. So they can reduce expense, the cost of that by at least $1.5 million a year by eliminating the worst performing of the schemes. Two of them are in mothballs already, and four are just about there, and there'll be a few more. The one I showed you, Wolpanda, is tremendously effective. Uh, and it also took 25 years for it to get there because there's a huge amount of water to remove. You wouldn't want to turn that one off. Yeah. Now, this is, the, this is the story. Here we have the effectiveness. If the red line is what salinity would have been, have that uh, by basin salinity management strategy. 
we would be through the roof with up to 1,600 DC units, twice the, the uh, allowable level, and many of the crops grown in the, in the river land in Sunrise here would have been killed. As it was, it stayed under eight, well under 800 DC almost all the time through that drought. Um, the gaps are quite large. Usually it's the, the, uh, the experience salinity is something like a half to, uh, or sometimes a third of the, what salinity would have actually taken place. Now the, the, this shows that the same sort of thing over the entire period from 1983. You can see there's a couple of wood flows in, in the, the period. Um, the, again, the red line is what salinity would have been if, if the, the, the uh, salinity management strategy wasn't there. Now, the really serious stuff, post 2000. What do we know? What do we notice about that? Look at the flows from two, year 2001 onwards. Extremely low. Extremely low. And a period from 1994 onwards with no flow over the, over the, over the floodplains. Now, what happened in that period due to Lake Alexandria? You all remember that the, that the level went down, way, way down. Here's a graph from the South Australian EPA of the levels of Lake Alexandria and Albert and the Gore Channel. Lake, Lake Alexandria is a solid line which is obscured by the Gore Channel line for a while, for a while. They're, they're the same. And what happened was that um, at this point here, they said, oh, oh um, Lake Albert is going to be a disaster. So they put a, a bay embankment across it and started pumping water into it from Lake Alexandria. And we'll show you why in a moment. And then from here, they said, oh, the Gore Channel is going to be in the same state. No water to pump into it, so they let seawater in there. And that's why that went back up, back up there. I let it go down a bit in order to allow it to be replaced by fresh water in this period of years. This is what would have happened with, if Lake Albert had been allowed to go down to that level of minus 1.5. Uh, uh, well, minus 1.5. Um, uh, uh, Australian height datum. The bed of Lake Albert and both lakes is underlain by, by sediments which have not been exposed for 6,000 years. They, uh, the level was controlled by the sea, the sea water. Uh, as the ice age um, retreated and the sea water rose, it reached its present level about 6,000 years ago. And from that time onwards, the level of the, of the lakes has been about sea level, which is there. There's the lowest tide range, of course, uh, in the Victor Harbour Gore area, the lowest tide range in Australia. And, and uh, there are some astronomical tide, but the, the, the fluctuations you see are due to wind, wind build up, or water, wind setups. So what would have happened? The, 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 the bacteria in that in those sediments are oxygen loving bacteria, and they initially used up the oxygen in the water. Then they started using up the oxygen in the sulfates, leaving sulfides. If you then expose that to air and put a little rainwater on it, what do you get? Sulfuric acid. And we live a, 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 a trip around the lakes in about that time with a CSIRO soil sonist taking pH measurements all around and we found pH is down to as little as 3.5. Seven is neutral in, in the area of Meningi down here. Uh, and if, you, if we had let it go down to, to, to the level of, of that, 
you would get, get huge amounts of old sulfuric acid form in our refilling. We would have killed a lot of the, of the all of the, the uh, life and water. Another another problem was, of course, the lack of, of the lack of flooding over these floodplains. I won't go into that very much because of time. But you, this it did. We were able to show in that time that water and environmental watering can be effective if you get it if you get it in time. This was the Monon Island area in the shallow floodplain. Now this post 2000 crisis resulted in the Water Act. It was agreed that the use of surface water should be reduced from down from that figure, 13,600 GL, by enough to partially protect environmental values. The question is by how much? The Water Act transferred authority to the federal government, relying on the on the federal powers of international treaty, the Ramsar Treaty being one, the Wetlands International Wetlands Treaty. On which uh, much of South Australia's uh, river is a power. The problem was they prepared a basin plan in secrecy. And you might remember that when they when the people leaked out how much was proposed in that secret plan to buy it, the farmers, having not seen any of this work at all and being deliberately excluded, exploded and they said, This is disastrous. What will happen to us all if we reduce uh, irrigation by a third around, around the whole basin? And who's, who's going to be affected worse? You know, you're talking about getting rid of whole communities uh, and, and, and with huge incomes, etc. With uh, huge amounts of money. Now, and the, protest, and the protest was justified, not necessarily in the sense that they, they were right in terms of scientifically. Really determine what is right scientifically. If you're going to preserve the environment, you, you uh, completely you go back to the original where there's no irrigation at all. But what is what is uh, important to preserve, and what is important to do with water in the river, and that's the question. And here's a commentary on that process by John Briscoe. He was a Harvard professor, a member of the High Level Review Panel of the Basin Planning, which was supposed to operate in secret. He was my boss when I was in the World Bank. And the, the top, in my opinion, the top water man in the world, he was awarded in September the Stockholm Water Prize, which is the Nobel Prize in the water sector. Uh, he knows more about what he did know because he died eight days ago. Very tragic, a common cancer. First thing he observed was that you were not giving yourselves credit. Australia did something which no other country could conceivably have managed. A 70% reduction in water availability had very little aggregate in economic impact. This, in my view, is the single most important water fact of the 21st century. This is he, he wrote in a letter to the Senate Committee of Inquiry about the, the, the review, the, uh, the preparation of the water, of the plan. Now, he says, and he goes on to say that the, the success of that management was largely due to the fact that it was very widely involving of everybody that could contribute and of everybody's interest. It was a huge effort uh, surviving that, that drought, you know, in the way that Australia did, was amazing. And I have worked in 15 different countries on water, and not one of them other than Australia could ever have a chance of getting anywhere near that sort of achievement. Um, it is the Australian, I suppose, uh, social tradition of a fair go and the ability to have a say and to understand what's happening. So he said, the highly secretive MDB Basin Plan process was an aberration. I would urge the government to start again, redefine principles, to engage all who have a stake in this vital issue. He also proposed that more 
of 2007 to be chucked out because anything that that uh, that relies just on, for example, federal empowerment and federal the federal therefore could say anything they like and do anything they like, is wrong. Of course, they chose not to do that. They've got a, a stake in it. This letter was written when Malcolm Turnbull was the man responsible for the initial process of, of, the, uh, of, uh, of the preparation based on planning secret. When uh, Tony Burke took over with the new government, South Australia had done some extra work showing and, 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 and had proposed, let's ease this off a bit to a, a lower, um, based upon new work that came in on social impact, to a lower um, buyback. So Australia then produced a, uh, a, a, a plan, a, a, some research which said, said to achieve these objectives well, you've got to have a buyback, not of 2,750 uh, kilometres, but 3,200. And Tony Burke wrote back and said, yeah, that sounds a good idea. The problem was, of course, he shouldn't have said that, because he's supposed to be consulting us, and there's a process, and he's supposed to get everything in by 2016. And not make a decision until then. So that that uh, idea that the Commonwealth has agreed to a 3,200 kilometre buyback is on the South Australian government website, but it's not on the on the federal government website or the Murray Island Basin Authority website um, because it shouldn't. It's, it's not authorised. And the problem is that the South Australian government, by leaving it on it on their website, in my opinion, is misleading the people. They need, it needs to be shown that we can't sit back and say, you know, uh, if we could. South Australia's interest is in a fairly large buyback, of course, because we have interest in some of the most, the, the, the um, environmental assets, the lower lakes and, and the floodplains and, and, uh, and low salinity, all these things which are improved by greater buyback and use of environmental water. We have the highest interest in that by far. But to, 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 to allow South Australians to think that, oh, yeah, it's all, all fixed now, we've got it fixed, by leaving that on the website, I think is wrong. Now, we will see what will happen about that. <laughs> so there's the new, new process. It provides, the, the Act came in, in to effect in 2012 with the, with the Basin Plan as a as a sub, as a addendum to the act, and it provided that we would uh, it would come into full effect in 2019. Not only does it provide sustainable diversion limits that are lower than the present one, and a process to evolve them by 2016, but an environmental watering plan, water quality salinity management plan, and critical human needs for South Australia. Um, that's really very important for us, of course. The water quality and management plan consists, uh, continues, which has become more, more sophisticated. A very important objective, important objective, is let's export, on the average, two million tonnes of salt out of, out of the Murray Mouth for the health of the River Murray, Lower Lakes and the Huron, and to maintain the Murray Mouth open. And here's a, 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 a plan of what the official buyback process and the negotiation processes. And that is to we're currently to we're currently <coughs> here right in the middle. We've we've bought back some, some uh, a bit more than half of the amount in order to get down to this level here, which is a 2750 buyback. And we're proposing to go back back down to it by then. And the adjustment, when all, all the information is in the, the, the sustainable diversion limit adjustment takes place from here on. And we don't know where it will go. We could go up there or we could go down there as a result of the studies that are yet to come in. And that's a, that's a close-up of the, of the range it could be. Here's a few final thoughts. All water solutions are provisional. People occasionally ask me, when are we going to solve the River Murray problem? Mm -hmm. River Murray problem. Now, 
a major river basin like this in a, in a vibrant economy like Australia's is not going to stand still. Technology changes, markets change, environmental uh, facts are discovered as time goes on. Climates change. Um, is that you, we should not be fixing in place what we decide today. There should be a process of, of moving forward from 2019. And that is one of my fears that it won't happen because that the war act puts things pretty much sets them in ice in 2019. Second, each succeeding generation takes for granted the achievements of their fathers and forefathers. I hope tonight we have a little bit of an appreciation of the amazing achievements that have that, that have been done with the River Murray in, in, in Australia. Australia. South Australia needs to lead in this, continue to lead, and unfortunately I don't see the leadership happening as it should. Because uh, when New South Wales decided to reduce the, its funding of joint River Murray works, South Australia said, oh, we're reducing it too. Big mistake. South Australia should lead and give no one else an excuse to reduce their funding. Contemporaries always wonder how those who went before could have been so short-sighted and stupid. Or they weren't, they just, they were just in ignorance of things that hadn't happened yet. Thank you.